My name is Ilan Timor. At times, you will see my name appear as Ilan Timor Trich, which was my name before I added the name Timor. I work at uh, New York University in uh, Manhattan, and uh, I am the director of OBGYN ultrasound in the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology. I worked there for the last 10 years, and uh, I also worked uh, at least uh, 12 years at Columbia Presbyterian in Manhattan. Um, I think that you will enjoy the slide presentation that uh, I put together in um, addressing uh, the fetal brain, normal and pathological fetal brain. And uh, I consider scanning the fetal brain an integral part of an anatomy scan. I also think that we have to scan a little more than what is mandated today, um, namely the axial planes using the transabdominal scan. And you will see in my lecture that I place a um, heavy weight on trying to get a coronal plane and a sagittal plane, namely the midline or, mi or, or, or median plane of the brain. This way we can really uh, give a thorough examination of the fetal brain. In this lecture I would like to talk about practical approaches to the evaluation of the fetal central nervous system. Before I get to the mature uh, fetal brain, let me talk a little bit about the first trimester and uh, I would like to review the developmental embryology using 3D ultrasound. If you um, scan a, um, an eight-week, eight-week, one-day uh, embryo with a high-frequency transducer, you are able to see quite a large number of brain structures at this early gestational age. Some of these are seen in this slide, and you can, you can recognize the uh, string of uh, sonolucencies that make up the convoluted um, primitive uh, brain ventricles of uh, this embryo. And uh, you can again see the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the area of the isthmus, the very narrow passage between the fourth ventricle, the future fourth, fourth ventricle, which is the rhombencephalon, and the mesencephalon. And that is the aqueduct of Silvius. If a uh, 3D uh, acquisition is done on such an early embryo at eight weeks and one days, you can see the median, axial, and coronal displays of uh, this uh, uh, fetus, this embryo containing the brain. If you then uh, invert the fluid field areas, you can uh, transform them in from an anechoic into a, uh, an echogenic uh, structure, which then represents the string of ventricles uh, almost like a cast of these uh, uh, primitive uh, fluid field um, structures in the embryonic brain. Here now you see uh, in the lower right part of the slide an anterior view of this inverted ventricular system. I draw your attention to the interhemispheric foramina of Monroe, which will be later important uh, to distinguish it with, uh, from uh, pathologies. Um, just putting together the lateral and the frontal view, 
um, please realize that a large number of embryonic structures can be seen at this uh, early age. Uh, several articles were in the literature that were capitalizing on these uh, views uh, to, uh, to diagnose a normal brain as well as several pathologies of the brain. At nine weeks and two days, uh, the ventricles change somewhat, and you can see the posterior horns um, that on the lower uh, superior view that they are more developed. The rhombencephalon is getting uh, progressively uh, relatively smaller on the expense of the uh, lateral ventricles that are um, in the hemispheres at 10 weeks and 4 days. Uh, again, uh, the rhombencephalon is a little smaller compared to the uh, lateral ventricles of the hemispheres, and you can see the imprint of the choroid plexus at 11 weeks and 1 day. Um, almost the same is seen. Again, the relationships uh, change. And if you then scrutinize this composite slide from seven weeks and six days to 11 weeks and one day, looking at the lateral, frontal, and superior views, you can see that the telencephalic vesicles, which are main, mainly the uh, frontal horns, uh, are uh, um, much smaller than at 11 weeks on the expense of the um, rhombencephalon, which becomes uh, uh, relatively small. So this is a natural development of the embryonic fetal brain where uh, the hemispheres uh, are uh, increasing in size and the posterior fossa, the cerebellum and so forth, uh, are uh, relatively smaller. Now, where can this be of uh, any clinical importance? And here is a, a semi-lobar holoprosencephaly at nine weeks and two days, in which uh, please uh, pay attention to the fuse, the anterior horns that are seen on the two-dimensional as well on the, uh, on the inverted image um, of uh, the anterior horn. And when you compare it to the normal, you can see that in the normal case, the falx com comes in between and separates the two anterior horns. And um, on the right picture, you see the fused anterior horns. This is uh, clearly evident on the orthogonal planes uh, in the upper part, the fused uh, anterior horns and the inversion of the uh, ventricles in the lower part encircled. A little later, at 10 weeks, a semi-lobar holoprosencephaly is shown with inversion rendering. And again, all what you see is fluid inverted. And in the lower uh, uh, picture, you see the imprint of the falx. And in all three, you can see the fused anterior horns. Later on, at 13 weeks, this is uh, now an alobar holoprosencephaly in which there is no separation between the lateral ventricles, and you see that there is no imprint of the falx on when you look at the, on the superior view. Here is at 14 weeks, five days, again a semi-lobar holoprosencephaly in which the anterior horns are fused and the posterior horns are separated by the imprint of the falx on the upper left and the upper right pictures. The composite picture shows the same again for comparison. Now we turn to the second and third trimester and uh, there are guidelines of performing the basic examination uh, and the fetal neurosonogram published in the ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology in 2007. This issue of the white journal uh, describes the basic and the targeted neuroscan. Here you see the three axial planes that are generated by uh, a transabdominal probe, the transventricular plane on the upper uh, picture, the transthalamic plane, of course, as the name implies, um, cutting through the, the two thalami, and the slightly posteriorly slanted transcerebellar plane, which uh, develops much in much more detail the posterior fossa with the two uh, cerebellar hemispheres, the cisterna magna, and this we see a little bit later, the vermis. 
the basic uh, brain scan has to contain, in addition to all the biometry that are, is common knowledge, also the following brain structures, the head shape, lateral ventricles, the cavum, septi pellucidi, flanked by the two walls, the thalami, the cerebellum, the cisterna magna, and the upper spine. Um, here is the transventricular plane, again, on which you see the frontal horns, the cavum septi pellucidi between the two lateral walls, the posterior horns with the choroid plexus, and again, you can measure the atrium of the lateral ventricle, preferably where it contains uh, choroid plexus. This is the transthalamic plane, again showing the frontal horns, the cavum septi pellucidi, the two lateral walls of it, the falx in the anterior part, the thalami on the two sides, and the hippocampal uh, gyrus uh, in this area. You, of course, measure the VPD, the head circumference, and the occipital frontal distance. The transcerebral plane, which I said is a slightly slanted um, axial plane, will uh, highlight the cerebellum, seen here, the cisterna magna, and uh, the vermis, however, this is not exactly the best uh, image to, um, to prove that there is a vermis. You can measure all the um, important measurements on this plane. Now, if an abnormality is detected during the basic scan, we then go and do a detailed or targeted fetal neurosonogram, which uh, is uh, recommended. Um, this is almost equal to a multiplanar imaging, which is best done on 3D. This scan looks at the brain in greater details and adds to the axial plane also the coronal and the sagittal planes, which are then included. It can be performed transabdominally, and uh, if possible, the, the fetus is in vertex presentation, then preferably transvaginally using 2D or 3D sonography. Um, we uh, add, as I said, the coronal sagittal planes, and in this case, all the sections radiate from one point, which is usually the uh, anterior fontanelle, as you can see it in this uh, picture. We sneak into the fetal brain through the openings uh, between the cranial bones. And uh, this slide demonstrates the major um, avenues into the fetal brain, the, the windows, so to say, the anterior fontanelle, the sagittal sutures, the metopic suture, the anterolateral, squamosal, and posterolateral fontanelles. The last three enable us to uh, try to sneak into the posterior fossa to see them much better. The lambdoidal suture is also used sometimes, but uh, rarely. And these sutures, of course, close as uh, pregnancy progresses. The suggestions for a uh, transvaginal or transabdominal sonography, as far as the coronal and sagittal planes are concerned, uh, have to contain the brain structures dele delineated here. The, the anterior and posterior horns, the third and fourth ventricle, the interventricular foramen, also known as Monroe, the cavum septi, pellucidi, cavum verge, as you will see later, the corpus callosum with its parts, the pericolosal artery, and uh, some of the nuclei, the thalami, the caudat nuclei, and then the posterior fossa with the cerebellum, the vermis, cisterna magna, interhemispheric fissure, and later on the gyri and sulci, um, and the, uh, the ocular uh, uh, scan. Here are some of the coronal sections displayed uh, in a view uh, to better understand a uh, frontal a mid-coronal, anterior mid-coronal section, a posterior mid-coronal, and a posterior occipital section. Here they are detailed. Uh, the frontal two, or transfrontal plane, contains the interhemispheric fissure, 
and the anterior horns, they are not peeking through on this picture, but you will see them on the next one, right here. These are the anterior horns. This is though a mid-coronal or trans plane going through the caudat nucleus that is seen under the lateral ventricles. You see the cavum septipillus with the two membranes uh, uh, separating it from the anterior, the frontal horns. Um, here is an occipital um, transcerebellar plane uh, showing clearly the occipital horns. Rarely will they be totally symmetrical. In this case, there is a slight asymmetry, which is normal. You see the interhemispheric fissure, the incipient um, gyration and sulcation of the brain. You see the cerebellar hemispheres, and you see the vermis and the, po and the cisterna magna. Um, no um, fetal, no detailed fetal neurosonogram is um, completed without seeing a median plane. A median plane is on is the is the single plane that runs through the midline. There are many sagittal sections, but only one median plane. Some people call it mid sagittal, mistaken term, but uh, widely used. On this you can see clearly the um, structures that are essential to uh, scan uh, whether the brain is normal or suspected for abnormality. Um, in a detailed fashion, here is the median plane in which you see the corpus callosum, the cavum septi pellucidi, the brain stem very important to examine, the pons, the posterior fossa with the, uh, in the median plane of the vermis, the fourth ventricle, the uh, cisterna ambience above the cerebellum, the cisterna magna behind and below the cerebellum. Um, at 16 weeks, don't look for the corpus callosum because it is not yet developed. At 22 weeks, however, you see it in its full beauty. Below is the cavum septi pellucidi. Uh, here you see uh, the anatomy enlarged and in more detail. The, the corpus callosum is not the bright echo above it, but the anechoic echo below the echogenic line. Um, here is the beak, the rostrum, the knee, the genu, the body or the corpus, the splenium or the tail, which uh, drops down almost to the quadrigeminal plate, and that is how you should consider it fully developed, reaching that milestone. Be below is the cavum septi pellucidi, and the posterior part of this cavum septi pellucidi is called the cavum verge. At times, it's large. This is not part of the ventricular system. They are isolated uh, structures that regress almost totally towards uh, delivery and in early infancy. This was a 22-week uh, scan. At 34 weeks, the corpus callosum is seen. The cavum septi is smaller, no cavum verge is seen, but the gyration and the sulcation of the brain is almost complete. Turning on the color, you can see the, uh, uh, the anterior cerebral artery that branches into a callosomarginal artery and the, and the pericallosal artery. You can see it with regular color, but the best is with power Doppler, has bigger sensitivity. And um, it uh, attests to the fact that the corpus callosum is present, and uh, I will talk about that uh, somewhat later. And again, to emphasize this point, no thorough fetal neuroscan is complete without displaying the median plane to scrutinize the corpus callosum and the vermis. On this slide, the oblique or parasagittal plane is displayed, and you can see here the entire lateral ventricle with the choroid plexus. The anterior part of it is called telachorioidea. You would look for a grade one bleeder under this area. You see in the thalamus, anterior horn, posterior horn, and at times also the inferior horn. However, that should really not be seen. If you see it, too la if you see it clearly, think of uh, a dilatation. 
Um, here is a, an image of the cortical surface uh, doing a median plane. And these were, of course, developed towards the end of the pregnancy. It is a sagittal as well as a coronal plane of a normal brain showing the gyri and the sulci that develop. Uh, one more issue, the uh, insula is developing at the beginning at around 20 weeks, which this is. And only a small indentation is seen later on the, the temporal horn and the occipital horn are uh, covering it uh, completely. Uh, that's the reason that it's called, it's called the island or the insula. Here is where you would look for the middle cerebral artery. Let's turn to three-dimensional ultrasound, uh, which can be um, a subject for navigating into the, in the volume and to perform multiplanar imaging. You have a lot of displays, but the difference between the 2D and the 3D displays are that in 2D, the pictures, uh, the sagittal pictures emanate from a, a central point of the fontanelle and radiate out. And in um, 3D ultrasound, after obtaining the volume, the display will uh, have all the planes parallel to each other, as in the CT or in MRI. First of all, we select the region of interest to obtain the uh, volume. Then, depending on our equipment, the scan head automatically acquires the volume. Um, the display, as far as I'm concerned, I like to have it always like this because then you don't make mistakes in identifying structures or sites. The coronal is in, in box A. The sagittal is in box B with the fetus looking to the left. And the axial is on box 3 with the occiput looking upwards. Right and left are as in the, in the, in the radiographic pictures. Then the question is what you do with the volume, how you get most information out, and what uh, display modalities you will use. And the first display modality will be, of course, the orthogonal plane in which you can then use the, the navigation with the marker dot. You can then use the stick slice in tomographic or in orthogonal plane display. You can look for vessels or in tomographic or angiographic three uh, display in the orthogonal planes. You can do inversions. You can look for volumes of the fetal brain. All these are the ways to look at uh, the fetal brain. So let's start with the multiplanar imaging. And again, if here I display them in box A coronal, box B sagittal, box C uh, axial. And these are uh, projections which are at right angles to each other, and you can study them simultaneously. And here is a little exercise in taking the marker dot with your um, cursor and go into the different parts of the brain. In this case, this is a pathology with a porencephaly, and you see that I'm dragging the marker dot. All three dots in all three boxes uh, indicate the same exact plane. Here, for instance, I am in uh, the area of the midbrain, and uh, soon I will put it on the vessel here, and you will see the vessel in all three projections. Um, volume contrast imaging is a possibility, and you can see here that the slice thickness can be varied from about 1 to almost 15 millimeters. Depending on that, you will see a better outline of the structures. Here is a very thin slice, and the previous was a very thick slice of it. Um, you can also display the brain in a, a, uh, in a way that is displayed in um, MRI or CT, uh, serial consecutive uh, coronal pictures taken uh, along the lines that are on the scout picture, which is a sagittal display. Here is a coronal display, and all the other pictures are along the lines here. Of course, this is the median plane with the corpus callosum. On the upper one, you see the um, right, uh, the right lateral ventricle, and on this one, the uh, left lateral ventricle. 
If you turn on color on the orthogonal planes, you can see the middle cerebral artery and the most important one, the pericolosal artery, which is seen here. You can then strip the uh, volume from all the soft tissues and you can display it in this modality or which is only the color angiogram or the glass body with the outlines of the fetal brain. In this clip, you can see a color acquisition was done and uh, here the, um, the sagittal is displayed in box A as you see and tweaking and moving the, vol the, the head into the positions that um, will present a complete and, uh, and perfect median plane. Um, we will look at the median plane here displaying the pericolosal artery and other arteries. The simplicity of this is really remarkable. Um, displaying the, um, the vasculature of the brain in uh, the angiographic mode, you can uh, employ the cine um, uh, display. And again, this is excellent for teaching and studying the different structures of the brain. Excessive fetal movement will result in poor quality volumes, which in uh, uh, its turn will uh, result in, in artifacts. Here is, for instance, a picture that was um, acquired while the fetus was moving. Please discard these. Don't try to analyze them because you will give rise to, to a lot of uh, unnecessary anxiety. Here is a six-slice display. Again, uh, the selected area which is displayed here is collapsed into a 2D image to enhance the borders of it. It is most useful when you have pathological findings. And again, in uh, this uh, uh, clip, you, I display how I scan the brain in the axial um, fashion in the lower right uh, box. Uh, following that will be a sweep in from ear to ear in the sagittal plane displaying the lateral ventricles as you see right now or the midline right now with the corpus callosum and the other side the brain ventricles here are here is a borderline ventriculomegaly uh, the right uh, 1.2 centimeters the left one 1 centimeter that are displayed in six slides Inversion is a cast, renders a cast-like appearance to the fluid filling the lateral ventricles. This um, was uh, all suggested many, many years ago in 1959 by Day, uh, who filled the lateral ventricles with uh, uh, wax, showing uh, them um, as uh, displayed here at 12, 18, and 32 weeks. We do the same right now just by doing an inversion of the fluid-filled lateral ventricles. Here, for instance, is an Arnold Chiari malformation. In the next slide, you see the fluid that was found in the uh, lateral ventricles. I will point out when it turns, and I'm stopping it here, the dilated third ventricle, which uh, clearly shows that this is a um, an obstructive um, uh, hydrocephaly, probably at the level of the uh, of the aqueduct of Silvius. You can measure brain volumes by outlining uh, in a successive um, fashion the turning volume of the brain, and this can be used to determine also gestational age if it's done correctly. Here is a clip outlining the acquisition of the brain volume. The posterior fossa is uh, shown on this clip. The acquisition was done. In box B, you turn the head into a coronal plane. In the box A, into an occipital up. Um, in box B now is clearly seen the sagittal plane, enlarging the picture and uh, concentrating on the posterior fossa. The dot, the marker dot, is put on the vermis, and in all three, you will see the display of the vermis. Going to a 
thick slice, we emphasize the finding. We, we can measure the cerebellar diameter of the cystenomagda and the nucleotranslucency. Enlarging the picture, the measurements can be done much more in a, in a um, much more uh, precise way. Here is the width of the cerebellum. Uh, in the next measurement, you see the height of the uh, cerebellum. Um, in addition to that, you can measure the cisterna magna right here measured. And if the picture is crisp enough, you can also relate to the nuchal fold and measure it in this, uh, uh, on this picture. Several clinical examples now. One is of an agent of the corpus callosum showing you the difference between 2D and 3D di diagnostics. Here is the corpus cephaly with a 1.1 centimeter uh, posterior horn. Uh, and the several sections that can be obtained showing several structure, structural anomalies like the falx is dipping down into the third ventricle. There is dilatation of the ventricles, dangling choroid plexus. There is no um, cross-section of the corpus callosum that would be in this particular place. Um, on the sagittal sections, there is a total lack of the corpus callosum. The pericallosal artery is not seen as a normal structure. There are different aberrant, aberrant vessels. However, watch the simplicity of it on a 3D orthogonal multiplanar set of pictures. Here are some of the indirect signs. A widely separated, vertically oriented lateral ventricles, the Viking helmet sign, as you see it here, and the interhemispheric fissure that, that meets the third ventricle. The other indirect sign is colpocephaly, which is the dilated posterior horns, and they also look like teardrops, should you reverse the direction of them. Uh, they are also parallel to each other, and if you do an inversion of the fluid inside, this is what you would see, and again, it should be clear that the colpocephaly is seen here. The anterior horns seem almost normal, and they are parallel to each other. Indirect signs are also the radial gyra and salsa on the median surface, which is called the sunburst sign, but be advised that you only see it when the salsa and gyra develop on at around 28 to 32 weeks. The only direct signs that you see on the medial plane are the corpus callosum, the, the lack, the missing corpus callosum, the cavum septi pellucidi, and the pericallosal artery. These all are missing. This I call the triad that has to be present in order to have a normal corpus callosum. Here is another example of the absent corpus callosum, absent sing uh, cingulate gyrus above it, and the sunburst appearance of the gyri. Another case, 24-year-old lady, G3P1, previous term pregnancy, ultrasound at 20 weeks was read at normal, at 28 weeks was read at porencephaly. Transabdominal scan shows definitely that it does not look a normal um, Transthalamic uh, and transcerebellar plane. The uh, sagittal sections in the midline uh, look um, almost normal. Uh, even the uh, cerebellum is seen. The fourth ventricle is somewhat uh, pressed uh, anteriorly by a fluid filled structure in the back, which also shows on the coronal scan. And if we are watching this uh, clip, you can clearly see that uh, there is a large fluid field area, but when you um, go anteriorly, the, uh, the vermis is clearly seen. Here is the bay of the fluid field area. Going back, here is the vermis again, perfectly normal. And this uh, structure was read as a, an arachnoid cyst. Uh, the question is, would you order a fetal MRI? And at this point, I don't think it is really necessary. I will be talking about the uh, use of MRI in subsequent slides. The ultrasound really established uh, the diagnosis. Uh, the cyst wall was seen. The normal fourth ventricle was seen. The tentorium and the torcular uh, is minimally elevated. 
and the hemispheres are displaced toward the anterior, the, cl the clivus, and upward. And the neonatal uh, scan is shown here, uh, clearly resembles or almost uh, similar to the, um, uh, the antenatal scan. Here you can see clearly the cyst wall in this area. Of course, an MRI was done after the delivery, which uh, reinforced uh, the finding exactly as you saw it in ultrasound. Um, the neonate had a shunt placed. The shunt was removed at two months of age due to infection. However, the size of the ventricle had stabilized, remained normal, and now, and at six months, it achieved all developmental milestones. This baby now is more than one year, one year and two months, and is developing normally. So neurosurgery called it an arachnoid cyst, and the MRI called it a megacyst and a mega versus an arachnoid cyst. Here is another patient who is 42 years old, referred for a second opinion anatomy scan for brain anomaly. The family and obstetrical history were unremarkable. And on this transabdominal 2D picture, not too much was, uh, was seen. On the coronal sections, however, we saw a large subarachnoid space and dilated uh, occipital horns, mainly one of them. The midline looked normal. Uh, the one side, the, the right side, looked pathological to us. And um, the question is again, do you need an MRI at this point? And I think that before you do that, you have to really explore the possibilities by the three-dimensional technique. Watch this uh, clip. I'm going from inside the ventricle and go outside the subarachnoid space, also shown on all of these. Go back into the ventricle, grab now the dot, again from the ventricle into the subarachnoid space, clearly shown by the other two pictures. And here again, going inside the ventricle seen on A and C, and, go and wandering outside uh, into the subarachnoid space. So clearly there is a connection with a posterior horn to the subarachnoid space, seen clearly on these pictures right here, the arrows show at this connection. Inverting it, and you already saw that I like the inversion mode because it gives me quite a nice um, uh, three-dimensional view. And you can see on this moving um, clip the connection between one of the lateral ventricles. This is the normal ventricle, not connecting with the subarachnoid space. However, this one does, and that's the fluid in the subarachnoid space. Again, let it go. And here, the um, annotations on it, left lateral ventricle, left right lateral ventricle, the connection, the site of the cleft with the subarachnoid place. So here are the differential diagnosis. Of course, this was a uh, schizencephaly. And uh, when we look at the uh, MRI, it definitely confirms the diagnosis uh, nicely. You can see here the, uh, the comparison with ultrasound in exactly the same planes. Here is the cleft shown by ultrasound and MRI. Ultrasound, again the cleft here, MRI, cleft, and here in, with MRI. So it's a unilateral right occipital open lip schizencephaly where the subarachnoid space communicates with the posterior aspect of the right lateral ventricle. Schizencephaly can be unilateral and bilateral. Uh, it can be closed lip and open lip. And here you have a um, diagram of uh, the four possibilities. Here is a closed lip schizencephaly with a unilateral and bilateral clefts. And here you have an open lip schizencephaly unilateral and bilateral. The next case, and probably the last one, is a 33-year-old G1P0, referred for second opinion anatomy scan for a brain mass. Family and obstetrical history were unremarkable. The horizontal axial pictures are um, 
almost unremarkable, but if you look closely, there is a fluid fill area in the posterior fossa, and there is a hyperechoic nodule in the, uh, in the posterior area uh, of the posterior fossa. Now the sagittal picture shows exactly the same, and we watched this uh, enlarged during our observations from 20 weeks to 22 weeks. And you can see here a three-dimensional picture. Now the fluid field space is much larger. The echogenic area is right there uh, the, of the same size. Tomographic ultrasound images were done. You should always do them in order to uh, um, see much better the anatomy in subsequent slices. Again, horizontal, sagittal pictures, which uh, clearly show the pathology. The in utero diagnosis was a thrombus of the dural sinus involving the torcular herophily or the confluence of the sinuses. And the reason for this may be that here four large draining veins um, meet uh, and uh, uh, are creating a um, slowing of the blood flow, which then may give rise to uh, thrombus formation. Here are the fetal MRIs, again, exactly the same picture that we obtained with uh, transvaginal ultrasound uh, looking at the fetal brain. Here is, though, the last case, <laughs> which was referred for second opinion for a brain anomaly. And now that you already have seen a similar case, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that um, in this case also the transabdominal sonography at 30 weeks almost uh, makes the diagnosis because you see here a large cleft opening on one side and maybe even on the other side. Again, the coronal sections are Im important, doing them by transvaginal scan. The midline looked uh, normal to us, however, some suggested that maybe there is a thinning of the corpus callosum, that may be the case. And again, uh, tomographic images are important to look at them, and here, again, the, the bilateral clefts are uh, pretty obvious. Uh, on most of the, of the uh, planes. 3D inversion was again done by me, and uh, they confirmed on the, uh, the, the cleft on one side. There was not enough uh, well-delineated fluid on the other one, so even inversion has some drawbacks. But on MRI, you see the bilateral cleft. Here are the coronal planes. So it's bilateral open lip schizencephaly. So let me sum up and uh, make draw some conclusions. Transvaginal, transabdominal, 2D and 3D fetal neuroscan is feasible and definitely here to stay. The most important task is to reassure the mother or the couple of a normal developing brain, and that you can do in an elegant way with 2D and 3D transabdominal and transvaginal scans. The second important task is to precisely diagnose the pathology for proper counseling and management. And let me just say that it is extremely important to invite the fetal or the, the neonatal and neurosurgeon rather uh, to sit in at these uh, counseling sessions because they can meaningfully counsel the patient before the baby is born, not waiting for the neonatal uh, imaging studies to be done. New technologies helped help in obtaining uh, more detailed and precise diagnoses. 2D and 3D ultrasound should be the first line diagnostic tool to image the normal and pathological fetal brain. MR should be used in selected and rare cases to confirm the ultrasound diagnosis before 22 weeks. And they definitely can be used later on when the cortex develops and when we expect to see heterotopias and, uh, and pathologies in the white matter uh, in which MRI provides a much better picture than ultrasound. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that I helped you 
um, gain an insight in the fetal brain scanned by ultrasound.